welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm Hello, everybody. Welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your Everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. So uh, this is the 2019 Christmas special. I'm super excited about this. This is the penultimate show of show 500, which will be next week, which will be the New Year's Eve episode. I'm going to record that right after this. And I'm super pumped about that. You have to watch that because I pulled out, well, not all the stops, but most of the stops uh, on that one, and uh, it's gonna be pretty baller. So, um, not to take away from what we got going on here. So, uh, let's just get right into it. The first wine, um, courtesy of my friends over at Creative Palette, thank you very much, uh, another year in a row, sending me uh, Bruno Payard. So you may remember Bruno Payard from episode 450, which was the 10th anniversary special. Uh, back in May, and uh, I got to sit down with Bruno at uh, Provine, and um, that was super exciting to be able to sit down with him. We do a 20 minute interview with him. It was part of uh, the entire interview, was part of the anniversary special. And um, uh, so every year for the past two, three years, or whatever, I've been getting his, his Blanc uh, Grand Cuvee. This year they sent me the rose, so changing up a little bit on me. So this typically retails for about $60. Um, so, uh, definitely want to check it out. So I won't go through all the history with it because, you know, watch the interview on episode 450 for that. But, um, the winery was founded in 1981. Um, and he was the first to print the disgorgement date on the bottle. So we're going to go look for that real quick. Um, first we're going to get the foil off. So we're going to look for that disgorgement date. And it was disgorged in July of 2018. All right. Um, so most of his wine or grapes are either organically or sustainably farmed, uh, whether it's his own 79 acres or, uh, the acreage that he buys wine from. So, uh, Champagne and Burgundy, these are two major wine growing areas that, that make, you know, world-class, well, they all make world-class wine, but like really, really outstanding wines and not all the grapes are owned by the producer. Yeah. Whoa. That's kind of a first. We're going to let that settle a little bit. Wow. So the, the wine wasn't ice cold. I got it out of the cellar, which was probably around 45 ish degrees. Cause I really wanted the wine to have more, um, flavors and aromas. So it looks like we're good. All right. Now I am lots of wine there. I am going to get up real quick and I'm going to get like a towel so I can wipe down the, the laptop because, well, yeah, <laughs> we don't want the laptop to, to crap out on me. That would be bad. Okay. You know me, I don't stop recording. All right. So, um, and the, this is, this is a, what they call a multi-vintage wine. Really, I guess all, um, I guess all, uh, what should we call it? Um, Non-vintage champagnes are, you could consider multi-vintage because by law they have to, each vintage, retain a certain percentage of the wines to use for reserve wines. And that's how they make they're non-vintage wines, not just Bruno Payard, but all champagne houses. Uh, that's how they do it. Nice. Okay. And um, mental note, make sure the champagnes from New Year's Eve are put in the fridge. Matter of fact, while I talk about that, we're going to do, we're going to put that, do that right now. So, um, 
anyway, so yeah, they have to retain a certain amount of their, uh, whatchamacallit, their reserve wine so they can use it for blending for non-vintage wines. But in Bruno Payard's case, he's got um, vintages going back approximately 25 years. And um, for, for this multi vintage for his multi-vintage wines. So he's got quite a bit of like reserve wines that are got some nice age to it uh, going on with his multi-vintage stuff. Uh, all of his stuff is extra brut, which you start with brut nature, and then you go to extra brut, and then brut, and then extra dry. And it makes no sense because you think extra dry would be drier, but it's not. It's actually kind of sweet. Uh, then you go to demi sec. I think I'm missing one there. And um, I didn't think it's sec, demi sec, and then do. Anyway, so six grams per liter of sugar or less in his dosage, which that's the sec, that's what they do for um, the uh, second fermentation. I'm um, sorry, when they, when they kind of finish everything off. He puts a little dosage in there to kind of uh, balance it out after they, not second fermentation, but when they do the disgorgement. And uh, so that way he still has a dry tasting wine. Um, he's, it's mainly Pinot Noir with Chardonnay. And like I said, his reserve wines go back at least 1985. Uh, the multi-vintage wines age at least 36 months, um, which is the minimum for just regular vintage wines. So uh, non-vintage, I believe, is 18 months. So he goes well beyond the minimum. Uh, his Blanc de Blanc is 48 months. His vintage wines lay age at least eight years. And then his Tete de Cuvée, which is the Nec Plus Ultra, or NPU, um, ages anywhere from 10 to 15 years. So maybe one day I'll get one of those. That'd be outstanding. All right, so let's get into, like how I, I uh, did all that. <clears throat> I know I wasn't on the camera, that was, I probably should have stopped and restarted, but you know me. All right, uh, of course, also if you know me, you know I don't use flutes. Not in general. New Year's Eve, I'll, I'll bust out the flute. But, uh, so real quick, why? Why do I not use the flute when I'm actually drinking bubbles? I mean, when I'm actually drinking bubbles and actually evaluating bubbles, you really want to have more of a normal wine glass now you don't need like one of those big Bordeaux or Burgundy bowls, but something like this, this is the Wine Folly glass, it's a good all-purpose glass, um, but like a white wine glass. It's good because you get just enough of a bowl so that you can really get uh, accentuate the aromas. The flute, all the flute's good for is to make it look make it look pretty, get all the little bubbles, you know, doing all that. So you really can't see the bubbles. I mean, you see the bubbles on top, but you can't see like you. Can, I don't know if you can see the bubbles, but in the bottle, the bubbles are going. So the, the flute, so you can keep seeing the bubbles go up. That's, it's just for show. All right, so let's check it out. All right, um, so on the nose, a slight little brioche, a little bit of strawberry to it. A little bit of like, um, well, like pasta. Um, so I've been using pasta water a lot because... Um, least contact gets you this bready pasta brioche type of thing. I don't get maybe the, I don't get necessarily the brioche part, but I get like, you get there's lees, there's been extended lees contact with it. Honestly, the nose is a little closed. It's not highly aromatic. So I'm really, I'm not making this stuff up. It's there, but it's very faint. Yeah, it's, it's more of a strawberry, a little bit of just that, you, you know there's Lee's contact, so for me it's more of a pasta. Um, the pasta itself, not really pasta water, but the pasta. It's just kind of like a clean uh, smell, like, you know, freshly washed down concrete type of thing. We'll do a little swirl there. You don't really want to swirl bubbles too much. Now what that has done is, is it really kind of accentuated kind of the, the airiness, the CO2 kind of coming out and enhanced really more the Lee's uh, aroma. It didn't really, for me, it didn't really enhance much else by doing this roll. Let's go and check it out. So besides aroma, 
just gonna double check, make sure that the audio recorder didn't stop. Because occasionally when I put the audio recorder in my, my pocket, that's why I stopped really leaving it, putting it in my pocket. I would hit the button or the button would hit like the pocket and it would stop recording. That's bad, okay? My voice is a little bit different. Um, so allergies, I guess, I don't know. I'm not suffering from allergies, but I know when my voice changes like it is, a little scratchy, not quite clear, um, that whatever's in the air is kind of affecting the quality of my voice. So this is your first time here. Sorry, the sexy, scratchy voice isn't normal. I don't know why I'm swirling it. I don't normally swirl bubbles, but habit, right? So really creamy, like the mouthfeel. You know, when I when I taste other bubbles, even if it's champagne method, you know, even if it's a cuvee, I'm um, sorry, cuvee, cremant, um, from France, which has to be a traditional or champagne method, cava, uh, French Accorda, these types of things that use champagne method, it's still not exactly like champagne on the mouthfeel. It's close. I mean, it's real close. <clears throat> and it usually tastes good. And it's usually at least half, if not more than half or less than half or whatever, 50, 60, 70% of what champagne costs, but like standard champagne, not, we're not talking vintage stuff. For me, on, on the palate, it's really more the the least characteristic than anything else. It, it's like almost a creaminess. Um, that's from more from the mouthfeel, from the from the bubbles. But there's almost like this vanilla, um, like a cream pie, with some with a touch of raspberry now, uh, and a little bit of strawberry. A uh, super light, really refreshing. Um, if my mouth is watering, I mean. Like I said, I don't know the exact dosage on this, but at less at six grams per liter of sugar or less, the acid's pretty high. I remember uh, Bruno really likes to have as much acid as possible, as little sugar as possible, because he really likes that bright, crisp, refreshing style of champagne. It's like, it's like a airy, it's like, you know, a really finely whipped cream that you're just, that's got a little bit of like pink to it, a little, like a little, little raspberry, a little uh, strawberry, not quite cherry, but maybe a little bit of that too. Just red fruited, like frothy, um, like milky cream that, that's just kind of just at rest in your mouth. I know it sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It's super tasty. All right, so we're gonna pop one of these bad boys on. Now, I have three of this style and one of this style. Those other ones that like, they have like a little like clamp on there, they suck. They absolutely are the worst. They are the worst in the world because they don't, this, this has a great seal. Those other ones, you clip, but they're not perfect and then they kind of lift up a little bit. So yeah, not good. All right, so let's move on to wine number two. That's a heavy bottle, man. All right. <clears throat> so this is the 2016 El Enemigo uh, Chardonnay. Uh, this is actually from um, Argentina, from Mendoza. And I uh, bought it at Central Market for $24.95. Um, well, right here. I put a brand new cartridge in the other night, so I know it's all full. Not awful, but all full. Um, so... This is a collaboration between uh, Adriana Catena and Alejandro Vigil, or Vigil. Um, so uh, Adriana's last name might sound familiar. She's a daughter of Nicholas Catena, um, you know, of Catena Zapata. And uh, she actually has a PhD in history. So she wasn't necessarily like staying in the wine family and all that, but she kind of got back into the wine family. And Alejandro is the head wine maker at Catena Zapata. So Catena Zapata is, oh, this is the 2016, if I didn't say that. Um, so Catena Zapata is like one of the like great 
uh, wine houses in Argentina. Now they make a wide range of stuff from entry level to really expensive. And usually they use the Catena Zapata uh, name for their higher end stuff. And they just put Catena for like say their 10 to $15 stuff, uh, which is all really good too. I've had, I've had a lot of their stuff. Um, so 100% Chardonnay, which that's good. Um, their vineyards um, are anywhere from um, 1,400 to 1,500 feet. Uh, I think that, no, meters. Yeah, meters. 1,400 to 1,500 meters, um, which is pretty high. And if it's wrong, I'll put it in the lower third that it was feet. Um, <clears throat> let's see what else. They, uh, these are put into French oak barrels of 500 liters. So I guess they're demi moods. Um, 35% of them are new. They use wild yeast, um, and they have a, looks like a moderate, um, looks like they have a moderate temperature for fermentation. It's in, it's in Celsius, 18 degrees Celsius. That sounds like it's around, I don't know, in the, I'm going to guess 60 to something here. Why don't we do this? Hey Siri, what's 18 degrees Celsius? 18 degrees Celsius 64. is 64.4 Wow, that was pretty good. I was guessing around the 60 to 70, mid 60s, right? Um, so that's a fairly cooler fermentation. Um, and then it's actually, that's, 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 it's, it's vinified in French oak, in the larger larger oak. Uh, and then it's aged for 12 months in French oak, also 35% new. Uh, El enemigo means the enemy, and their little quote here is, at the end of the journey, we remember only one battle, the one we fought against ourselves, the original enemy, the one that defined us. <clears throat> they also make a Malbec of this. Uh, so I haven't seen the Malbec, but I hear it's pretty good. All right, so let's just get into it. So I get slightly baked apple, like a golden apple. Um, it's really more apple-y than anything else. You get a touch of some of some baking spice, some vanilla, but not a whole lot, and that would lend to the fact that they would only use thirty five percent new rather than, say, I don't know, sixty five percent new. A little bit of peach, a little bit of orange, almost like a like an orange uh, dreamsicle type of thing, because you know it has the vanilla and all that in there. I want to say there was a touch of grassiness to it too. I'm not sure. When I taste it, we'll see if there's any like herbaceousness to it, but super golden color. I mean, I know it's only 35% new, but it did vinify in oak barrels. So that's still going to leach out a little bit of color there. All right, let's taste it. It's super rich. I got a little floaties in there too. I'm not sure if that's any of those from the cork. So when you use the Corvin, I love the Corvin, but there's always a possibility you may get small little cork pieces because you know, you're know you sticking this needle, can't really see the needle, you're sticking this needle into the cork. So um, the cork is sometimes not gonna get just pushed away, it's gonna go all the way through. So not a big deal, but just so you know, you might see You'll see it more with white wine than, than red wine. It has like a richness to it. And kind of a, like I said, baked apple, like I said, on the, on the palate, I mean on the nose. With the palate, it's really there. But there's an extra richness. It's almost like really heavily baked, almost like an apple pie. Um, more of golden apple, not red delicious, not green apple, but like a really golden apple. Um, so there's a brightness to it. It's not, it's not like super sweet, um, really flavorful, but it's, it's really apples for days. And then a touch of like, like orange marmalade, uh, a little bit of peach to it. Um, so yeah, you got a whole bunch of stuff going on here. 
Um, it's super delicious. Um, and I can see why people like this. Um, yeah. Now, is it my style of Chardonnay? It's a little bit over the top for me. I want something a little more reserved personally, but I recognize that this is a really well-made wine. And the fact that it's not a huge amount of new oak, I like that part. It's, it's, it's like, it's a kind of pushing that limit. It's kind of like, come on, Mark. Come on, you know you like that. Come on, you know it. And I do, I like it. It's very tasty. Very, very, very tasty. All right, let's move on to wine number three. So wine number three is a 2014 Domaine Vacheron Sancerre Rouge. Did I, did I sound okay on that? Did I, did, did, did I not sound too over the top with my bad French accent? So yeah, Sancerre Rouge, right? Red Sancerre, they make red Sancerre? Absolutely they do. Not a whole lot of it, but so, uh, so <clears throat> if you drink a lot of Sancerre, hopefully you know it's Sauvignon Blanc, right? If it's the white, if it's the white version. The red version is, did you guess it? Pinot Noir. So, anyway. So with this one, I paid uh, 36 bucks. I got it from Som Select. You know, I, I like buying wine from Cobble there. Uh, so I'm just gonna kind of read the stuff from Som Select's page. It's one of those wineries that doesn't really have a uh, web page. A lot of these smaller French producers or just smaller European producers just don't have web pages. So you have to go by whatever, who, who you bought it from, or maybe the distributor has like a little page about the winery, but that's about it. So um, they talk about using natural winemaking. Okay, so natural winemaking, that's a broad subject. So I don't know exactly, well, we're gonna find out but we're gonna find out what they mean by natural winemaking, all right? So, they say natural winemaking at Domaine Vacheron is second nature. Taking care of the soil and in turn the vine is of the utmost importance. Uh, vines have been cared for biodynamically since uh, the early 2000s, okay? So, <clears throat> let's, talk, let's talk about that real quick. Natural wine doesn't, um, doesn't doesn't necessarily tell you exactly how the wine was farmed. It's more about the wine making, not necessarily the farming practice. Now, can you call, say, a conventionally farmed wine natural wine? Probably not. But organic and bio, you can, or maybe even sustainable, right? And it doesn't have to be certified by net biodynamic or certified organic. They just have to be practicing those uh, philosophies. Um, okay, and, this, and the estate is certified in both organic and di biodynamic practices. Okay, they're certified or certifiable. I don't know. <clears throat> no synthetic materials whatsoever are used in the vineyards. The family makes its own organic compost. Uh, yields are naturally low. Harvest is exclusively by hand. Uh, grapes are fermented with indigenous yeast in a combination of stainless steel or cement tanks and wooden open top fermenters. Wines are aged in either large oak cask or French oak barrels, depending on the crew and the vintage and are bottled unfiltered according to the lunar cycle. And that's the whole biodynamic part of that. So what's not mentioned in here is sulfur. So natural wine, a lot of times, sulfuring at the end <clears throat> or not sulfuring at the end is the norm. Or if they do sulfur, they're sulfuring very, very, very little. Now, that's one of my points of contention with natural winemakers is like, if you don't sulfur your wine at the end at all, then you're risking the wine going bad at some point pretty soon. So this wine is five years old, um, or at least was harvested five years ago, when it was bottled probably more like four years ago. Um, but we'll see what it's like. I haven't even smelled it yet, but um, when I see natural wine, I, I'm a little skeptical of it, but I've also had a lot of great natural wines. I've also had a lot of bad natural wines, So and not a lot of in-betweens, to be honest. All right, let's check it out. Okay, it doesn't smell bad. That's a good sign. And I wouldn't expect that, not from Som Select. I wouldn't expect Cobble to be throwing out wine with mouse and VA, horrible amounts of VA and, and just spoilage and stuff like that. 
So um, really a darker cherry to it and, and kind of an earthiness, um, a woodsiness to it, a little bit of bramble. And this is one of like maybe a handful of Sancerre Rouges I've actually had. So I don't have like a, a baseline of what Pinot from that area should smell and taste like. But yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a darker cherry, but it's a little bit bright, a little bit bright on the nose. It's not like, it's like a really fresh, darker cherry, but it's not black cherry, right? All right, wine is sound. Always a good thing. So, um, it's delicious. And it's definitely different than, you know, I, you, I just spent, you know, what, 12 days in Oregon. Um, I've been to Burgundy. Um, and somewhere in between this, this wine. It's, it's leaning more on the older world side, but it kind of reminds me of some of the Oregon wines. And rather than necessarily Burgundy, it's definitely lighter. Um, in, in mouthfeel, in tannin structure. Um, the acidity seems to be kind of high on it. I mean, my mouth's still watering, or it could be still from the Pruno, I don't know. Um, there's, there's a little bit, it's kind of hard to tell because I have a red background here, but for only five years old, it kind of is kind of a little brown. Um, here, let me get <clears throat> my uh, white card out. Yeah, there's like this, kind of brownish red quality to it, which, you know, for a five-year-old wine, I wouldn't necessarily expect that. I probably on the, on the color would have pegged it for older than five years. So sulfur is a natural preservative. And if you don't put a lot of sulfur in it, then you might get some more oxidation because the sulfur is going to bind with the oxygen to help slow down oxidation. Now I'm not saying they put any sulfur in it. He probably just put just enough just to like keep it from spoiling. I don't know. Maybe he sulfured normally. All right, so it has at least 10 parts per million of sulfur in it because it says contains sulfites. Or is it 20 parts per million? I think it's 10 parts per million. It has to be labeled on, on, the, on the label. So that's still not a lot of sulfur, to be honest. I mean, it has like 10 on there. But anyway, so continue with, with, the, with the flavor profile. Um, the cherry really still comes through. Um, it's, there's a little like, like some wood quality to it. Uh, not like new wood. It's not like, you know, like vanilla and clove and all that. It's just, it's more of a, more of a, just like the feeling of wood. Um, a little bit of fresh earth to it. Um, I mean, it's, I really, really like this wine. Like I'm excited to try more Sancerre's, you know, more Pinot from Sancerre because if this is ind indicative of the style, this could, <clears throat> It's giving Oregon a run for its money. And this is one wine, so I don't know. I mean, I've had, I've had a lot of, I probably have had like a hundred some odd Pinots from Oregon, and it pretty much solidified. That's my preferred style of, of Pinot. And I'm not gonna turn down Burgundy by any means. Um, and really well-made California wine, I'm gonna definitely drink it too. Uh, New Zealand Pinot Noir. You know, if it's, if it's well-made Pinot Noir, or just wine in general, I'm gonna drink it, all right? But this has like a touch more of that earth quality uh, that takes me back to the older world. But if I was getting blinded on this, I totally could throw this in, in Oregon. Absolutely, I could. Uh, and if I said, and they said, no, it's Sancerre, I'd be like, okay, well, at least I didn't say it was California Pinot, right? Yeah, the, the somewhat darker cherry, little earthiness, little wood quality to it. There's a touch of spice, not a lot. Um, super easy to drink. It's nice, I like it a lot. Okay, so, is that it? No, because 
I'm doing something special for Christmas. So talking with some people, talked about eggnog. So at Total Wine, I went ahead when I was buying my baller champagne, I was like, I want to have some legit alcoholic eggnog. I like, I love eggnog. And normally I don't buy eggnog with alcohol. But if I buy eggnog, it's so regular eggnog and I throw like 151 in it. I actually sold some 151. We've had it forever. Um, I definitely crushed a lot of that in the past. So I heard about this Pennsylvania Dutch and then somebody else I knew was like, oh, if you're gonna do that, you need to have uh, rompope. I was like, what? So Mexican eggnog. So new glass. Let's get into this really quick. Okay, so so both of these are nine ninety nine. This is a what? This is a one liter. No, it's one point. This is a one point. This is a one liter, and this is seven fifty. If I remember correctly, um, seven. It's got to be a seven fifty. Anyway, um, <clears throat> there's no way it's a liter. So both nine ninety nine. So this is the Pennsylvania Dutch eggnog, um, and I'm just gonna what their description is. It's a blended whiskey with dairy cream. Rum and brandy, um, and then uh, it's only released for the holidays. It has a seventh month shelf life. So what's eggnog? First of all, it's the, like the, the one sentence version of eggnog. Uh, it's originated from the early medieval British drink called posset or posset, P-O-S-S-E-T, which was made with hot milk that was curdled with wine or ale and flavored with spices. In the Middle, Age, middle Ages, posset was used as a cold and flu remedy. And then you can go to Wikipedia. I'll put a link on Wikipedia for it. Um, oh, brandy, Madeira, sherry, rum, ale, whiskey, bourbon, and even moonshine have been used to spike, basically, uh, eggnog over the years, over the centuries. You can, I'll, go to the Wikipedia link. You can read all about the history of eggnog and who was drinking it, what kind of styles they're drinking, and what they were doing. But um, that's basically the, uh, the gist of it. So let's check this one out. I may not spit this. All right. Oh yeah, you can taste the whiskey in this. You can definitely taste the whiskey in this. Um, but it's not, it's not, not a balance or anything. It's like, it's like, who the whiskey and that's it. It's just creamy, custardy. Um, all the spices that you should have in an eggnog, you know, that nutmeg, uh, clove, not only cinnamon, but like nutmeg and clove, that type of stuff. Uh, super creamy. It's really custardy, you know, very, very, very custardy. Probably have to get another glass. Just so I'm not getting completely schnockered. Um, I would say shake before pouring. Oops. It's 14.75% alcohol. <clears throat> so yeah, rum, brandy, and blended whiskey is what they used for that. That's super tasty. All right, I'm going to get one of the other glasses. It's okay, I only really need one glass for the next episode. I have one more glass over there. All right, so let's get into this one. This is the Santa Clara Rompope. Uh, 13%. It's a vanilla liqueur, they call it. Uh, if I remember correctly, this is usually just whiskey, typically for Mexican uh, eggnog. They don't, they don't normally put um, rum and brandy in it. Like, man, the color. I don't know if you could see the color difference. I mean, you can see the color difference in the bottle. I mean, it pours out the same way. I mean, this is like, like yellow. And, you know, that's more of like a white creamish. Let's see, it says on the back... Um, Water, sugar cane, alcohol, milk powder, modified starch, milk fat, egg yolk, vanilla emulsifier, FND, FDNC, yellow, blah, 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 blah. Um, water, sugar, cane alcohol. So I think it's rum. The cane alcohol is rum. So let's see. Yeah, da, 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 da. Oh, it says after the bottle has been opened, needs no refrigeration, just so you know. Uh, I don't know if it says serve chilled. The other one says serve chilled. Um... I can't remember if this one says to keep it cold after you open it. I think it, I think it says you don't have to. No, it says refrigerate after opening. So this one, you need to refrigerate. This one, you don't. All right, let's check it out. 
has, it looks like it's even thicker than the other one. Okay, so check this out. It's gonna sound weird. It feels like I walked into like a Costco. Like when you walk out of the Costco, at least the one that I go to, all the tires are there. So it's kind of like that. So I don't know if it's actually like <clears throat> in reason you get that petrol and you can get rubber. It's a TDN it's called. I don't know if there's any TDN in this, but it's kind of cool. I mean, really. But besides that, uh, it definitely doesn't have as much kick. I know, well, one, it's less alcohol, but it doesn't have as much kick. It's less smoother um, in taste. Uh, you don't really feel and taste, like this one you taste, you know, the whiskey and the brandy and the rum. This one, you know there's alcohol in it, but you don't really, it's not like overpowering. No, over, this is not overpowering, but it's like completely imbalanced. Like it's almost hidden, like it's sneaky. Like sneaky good on that. So you really can feel the alcohol when you when I exhale when I do the retro nasal. But so besides the the rubbery type of stuff, um, super creamy. It's not as custardy as this one, but it, it, it's kind of more eggy, I guess, which is fine. But I feel it's a little more cinnamon to it. Uh, you get the nutmeg to it, uh, a little bit of clove. Um, I feel it's like a more, I want to say the word elegant, but more subtle version of eggnog. It's like, it tastes really good. It goes down smooth. And if I drank like a bottle of that, I'd be like wasted. Like I would be like, yeah, man, I'm gonna drink a whole bottle of this and not even feel like it's really that bad. Whereas this one, I'm like, oh yeah, I can kind of feel it. It's still delicious. I don't know, man. They are completely, not contrasting styles, but they're definitely different. It's not like drinking the same thing and you're like, oh, they taste the same. They don't taste the same. I see why people really like the Ron Um, I like them both. To me, it's a little bit, a little bit different and that's why probably I like it. Uh, I might actually pick this a little bit over, over that one, but they're both delicious. So, cheers to you. Let's have some eggnog, have some bubbles, have some Chardonnay from Argentina or some Pinot from the Sancerre, and enjoy your Christmas. Um, so yeah, uh, if you're watching the website, there's some links above over there somewhere. There's a link somewhere to friend me up. If you're watching on YouTube, click the subscribe button. Maybe there's like a bell somewhere I guess you're supposed to click so you get the notifications. Um, tell your friends about it. Uh, subscriptions are a little bit up, but I'd like to see them go up a little bit more. If you're watching this on the, on the podcast feed, tell me, you know, if you're not already a subscriber, subscribe to the podcast in iTunes, your favorite podcatcher. Um, there's a link on the website. If you go to the website, there's a link about PayPal if you want to send some ducats my way so I can buy some more eggnog. And we'll see everyone again next time.